I spoke to you earlier about the moments that this convention has meant to me in my life and the moments that have stood out. And one of those was a few years ago in this very hall when we announced the first ever female president of ISNA. And tonight, inshallah, she'll be, she'll be speaking to us no longer as president, but as someone who will continue to serve this organization, Dr. Ingrid Matson. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in. Well, now that I'm no longer president of ISNA, I feel liberated to uh, say what's on my mind. No, I, oh, I always did. But, um, you know, I have prepared a talk here uh, that addresses the theme. But as I was coming here, there were some people who were mentioning the uh, talk that we had last night, the panel that we had last night. And during that panel, we were speaking about some of the hardships that we faced last year. It was a really difficult year, 2010. And during the month of Ramadan, which was a month when we wanted to be the most connected with our religion, we found the most very disturbing kind of statements and opposition to Islam and Muslims in America. It was, it was really a very troubling month, and I know I, I was disheartened in some ways. But one of the things I, I mentioned last night in response to a sister's question, this sister lives in Gainesville, Florida, and she spoke about all the effort that was made last year to prevent um, one, we could say, rogue Christian pastor from burning the Quran. The fact that despite all those efforts, that in the end, he went ahead and did it anyways, even though the vast you know, a large almost consensus of Christian leaders told him that it was not a Christian thing to do. So she said, I feel so bad, I feel like I didn't do enough. And one of the things I said to her is to remember this, that the Quran is preserved in the hearts of the Muslims. It is not primarily preserved in books. In fact, even at the time when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, the Quran was not preserved as a complete book at that time. It was preserved in the memory and the hearts of the Muslims. So the, the physical book is only a memory device. The main source of the Quran, of course, the Quran is the eternal living word of God. And as such, it could never disappear. But even on this earth, we preserve it within us. And I thought, you know, one thing maybe we could do tonight is to prove that together and to remind ourselves of that. Now, I was thinking of taking a poll of hands and asking how many hafaz there are in the audience, how many people here have memorized the Qur'an, and then asking, oh, someone raised their hand already. You have memorized the Qur'an, sister? Okay, well, maybe I'll begin with that. Let's just show, show of hands. We have at least one person in this audience who has memorized the Qur'an. Can you please raise your hand if you have memorized the Qur'an? I think actually you deserve a hand, so if you'll stand up, if you've memorized the Qur'an. <laughs> MashaAllah, these brothers and sisters are a very small representation of millions of Muslims across the world. And it doesn't take a lot of resources. We know that there are children who are living in one-room houses who memorize the Qur'an, who eat perhaps six, seven hundred calories a day, yet they still memorize the Qur'an. So the Word of God does not need a lot to sustain it. We only 
need to commit ourselves to being part of that great tradition, to be part of that beautiful fellowship of people who retain the Word of God in our hearts. But let's, I want to include everyone. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there's one verse of the Qur'an that is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an, that if you read it, it is like reading a third of the Qur'an, and that is Surat Al-Ikhlas. Now, I'm not trying to begin uh, to uh, establish some kind of uh, innovation in worship here. Dr. Muzam al-Siddiqui, you can interrupt me if you say I'm doing anything wrong here. But I think just for the sake of our own awareness of what this community is able to do together and what we have within us, apart from anything external to us, I would like us to read one third of the Quran out loud together. So I begin Bismillah, Audu Bilahim and a Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Kulhua Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad, Kufwan Ahad, MashaAllah, Sadaqallahu Ladim, Hamdulillah. I hope that you retain this awareness and understanding as you leave this convention, as you go back to your communities, as you carry forward in Ramadan. You are the ones, you are the preservers. No one can hurt that. No one can hurt Islam, no one can hurt the Quran as long as you carry it with you wherever you go. And with that, inshallah, we'll have success. Now, sister, you can start timing me because this is the real beginning of my talk. I was, I was asked to address the, the topic today, and I, if you'll have a little patience with me, it may sound somewhat academic at the beginning, but if you can pay attention maybe a little more closely at the beginning, then you'll understand my point. And what I want to, uh, the title of my talk is Fences Make Good Neighbors. When I was studying first year Arabic, our professor occasionally read to us from a book of Arabic proverbs. I recall being struck in particular by the expression, ajar qabl al-dar, choose the neighbor before the house. My initial reaction was that this proverb opposed one that I grew up hearing my mother say, fences make good neighbors. The Arabic saying seemed to stress the importance of human relationships. And my mother's words, and she is a Christian woman of English and German heritage, seemed to me to stress distance and separation. Now, this understanding, of course, was undermined by the knowledge that I knew my mother. And although she valued privacy, I knew she was not an unfriendly person. Therefore, I wanted to explore this apparent dichotomy on a deeper level to see if there were indeed some essential differences between English and Arabic culture or Christian and Islamic perspectives on how we should live together. So let me step back in time. When I first heard this saying, choose the neighbor before the house, I can tell you that this came at a time in my life when I'd been Muslim for only a few years. As a convert to any religion will tell you, there are always many people around who look at you as highly malleable in your faith, and they hope to influence your views and practices in one direction or another. As a new Muslim, the proper relationship of Muslims to people of other faiths was certainly one of the hot topics about which everyone seemed to have an opinion. Some Muslims forcefully asserted that the dividing line between Muslims and all non-Muslims, in fact, was a demarcation between perfection and corruption, guidance and misguidance, good and evil. The belief in the complete absence of goodness in any uh, people outside of the community of believers 
compelled these ideologues to essentialize any apparent differences in our communities. Even simple cultural differences were for these people a sign of a deeper core value or lack of value. Now, if I had embraced this ideology, it would have been easy for me to look at the difference between the English and the Arabic proverbs about neighbors as a sign of essential differences. I could have looked at, to the Arabs as warm people who care about neighbors and human relationships and the English as cold individualists. Now, the antidote to ideology is knowledge, both in the form of scholarly learning as well as common sense. So if I was going to get to the bottom of the meaning of these apparently different approaches to neighbors, I was going to have to do some more research and to think. What I first learned is that my mother's saying was in fact a widely articulated European proverb that came in many forms, most famously perhaps in its appearance in Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall, where it reads, good fences make good neighbors. Now I realize that there had been an ellipsis or an absence in my mother's statement, an assumed meaning, which is what the word ellipsis means in my mother's statement, and that I had as a child utterly misunderstood her meaning. When my mother said fences make good neighbors, I thought she had meant she preferred a wall of stone and mortar to a human being as a neighbor. I had thought that she meant that dealing with human beings who are needy and nosy is more trouble than they're worth. In fact, what she meant, and what the saying means, is that it is easier to keep good relations with your neighbors if there are clear boundaries between your property and theirs. Property disputes are avoided and privacy can be maintained when these lines are clear. The fences, while keeping neighbors apart in some aspects, also allow them to live side by side for many years in peace. The relevance of this story for today is that all too often religious polemicists make the kinds of leaps of judgment that I could have made in this situation. If we are to be people of integrity and honesty, we have to push back against these simplistic approaches to each other's languages and cultures and experiences. How often have we read polemical approaches to Islam where the sacred sources of our traditions, our traditions, the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are ascribed a negative meaning because all of the tools of proper exegesis historical and cultural context, grammar and linguistic analysis are ignored in a frenzied search for an essential rotten core. I am sure that Christians have experienced the same kind of assault on their tradition by hostile outsiders, in particular the neo-atheists and their complete distortion of any religious tradition and their texts. So what does our tradition really say about neighbors? And there are so many teachings and so little time to speak about it. But we can begin with the Quran, which says, worship God and do not ascribe a partner to him. Treat in the best manner your parents, as well as your relatives, orphans, the needy, the neighbor close to you, and the neighbor who is a stranger, your companions, the wayfarer, and your slaves. Verily, God does not love those who are conceited and arrogant. So here is a clear teaching. And the scholars have said, uh, many of them have said, that the neighbor who is a stranger is in fact the one who is not a Muslim, specifically Christian or Jewish neighbors. And when we say the neighbor treating the neighbor well, we absolutely mean those of any faith. It's reported that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Gabriel kept advising me to take care of the neighbor to the point that I thought he would make him an heir. And that this statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in response to a question from one Muslim who asked whether he should give some, uh, um, some of the meat of a lamb that he slaughtered to his Jewish neighbor. The response, absolutely, the neighbor is so critical regardless of their faith. 
Now, what is this? What is this? What is the role of this statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? What is the role of this Quranic verse? This, in fact, is Sharia. Ah. Sharia ah is simply what guides our behavior, what is right and what is wrong for us to do. It is our ethics, it is our values, it is our principles. This is Sharia, ah, and it is Sharia ah that requires us to have excellent relationships with our neighbors. And let me just do a quick fact check here. I just was with the MINA group ages 12 to 18 and I asked them a question and I'd like to ask you this question and then another one. First I would like to ask, raise your hand if you have any relative, aunt, uncle, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, uh, sister, brother, some relative, blood relative, or relative by blood or marriage, who is not a Muslim, who is a Christian or a Jew or someone else. Raise your hand. When we look at the diversity of the Muslim community, I would say that this is probably maybe 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent of the audience raise their hand. The significant number of our community is related by blood or marriage to someone of another faith. Bonds of love and blood keep us together. We are not a community that is somehow separate from everyone else in this society. We already have our futures, our hopes, the very existence of our families entangled with people of other communities. Now let me ask another question. How many of you would count among your closest friends someone who you would regularly go to for advice, invite to your home for dinner, or socialize with on a regular basis? How many of you would, con would count among the, your closest friends a non-Muslim? I think it's most of the, the vast majority of people in this hall. So this is the reality of our community. And so when we bring together our religious teachings with the reality, then we can see an accurate reflection of who our community is. And it is because of both this religious commitment, this ethical commitment, as well as the reality of our lives that our community is already committed to the common good. We have Muslims across this country who are working on a regular basis for the betterment of this society. We have over a dozen health care um, centers who have been, that have been opened and who are run by Muslims. We have hundreds of examples of soup kitchens, shelters, um, volunteer work that are done for the general community. This community raised thousands and thousands of dollars for the people of Haiti, the people of New Orleans, the floods and the hurricanes that plagued this country just in the last uh, six months, the Muslim community has donated generously. So we do not need to justify our presence. We do not need to start from scratch. We already have very deep roots in the society. We have a good start. And the key is to keep focused on the right thing and not get distracted by those people who would love for us to be distracted, to burn and expend all of our energy into endless, endless and fruitless debates um, framed in a manner that of their own making, where we constantly are turning our attention to defending ridiculous accusations about Islam instead of turning to those who already have, have opened their arms and opened their hearts to us and working with them to address the real problems of this society. I urge you, certainly things are going to get more difficult in the next year. We are going to struggle with a lot of political, um, politicization of religious discourse, of prejudice. Don't get distracted. Remember that we have a very strong foundation. 
We have our friends and our neighbors. We have a very good basis that we're already, um, that we continue to build on. And inshallah, Allah will bless us for as long as we continue to do this work with sincerity. May Allah bless all of you and your families. Assalamu alaikum.